Hey, welcome back, uh, everyone. So let's just continue our Bayesian statistics seminar. Um, so last week we talked about the first, the very first implementation of the STEM model of a binomial function, right? To solve our uh, globe tossing exercise or the a variant version of the coin flipping exercise. So we did uh, the data. We did. Uh, we do have the data. We have nine times of experiment and six times of water observation, and this follows a binomial function. And we were trying to find the posterior distribution of the unknown parameter p or theta. Uh, so the bigger picture is we have the data. We wanted to solve the unknown parameter. We could. Do as I said, we could do numerical uh, integration. We can do that for this simple exercise. Analytically, we could also solve it by grid approximation two lectures ago. And uh, we could also do a Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC to, to use sampling method to find uh, the shape of the posterior distribution. And to do that, we used the STAN uh, language. And STAN language, it has many interfaces. For example, with R, with Python, with uh, MATLAB, with uh, Starter, so quite a few others. And we focus on the R stand here and we wrote our very first STEM model. So here, I show you briefly again what a STEM model looks like. So STEM, the STEM language is a block-based language if you still recall the idea. And if we uh, open a new text file, there's, it is empty, right? We first save it as something dot stand. So the file extension is stand. The last time we saved my first stand model dot stand. And then after saving, converting the file type, we could write down the structure, the skeleton of all the block names. To be a minimum uh, version of the stand model, we have to have three blocks. So one is here, the data block where Def which defines what we know already about the data, what are observed. Uh, here we declare uh, the, the, the letter of W and N for the number of water and total number of experiments. And the next block is parameters. Here we define, declare anything that we are interested in, but unknown yet. So here the theta parameter is the, the theta, the parameter in the binomial function. And the last block, the model block, is the place to, to make the connection, to connect the known data and the unknown parameter. So when we have the data, the parameters, and the model block, the stand file is complete. And then we call um, the stand function in R. So we prepare every data point, every data file in R, the data variable, and we a call from the stand estimation from R, and then this one calls the stand running, and it runs in the background and returns the results back to us in R. So this is the general idea, right, if you still remember. Okay, good. So we wrote our first stand model last time, and then we estimated it. We uh, found some results of the posterior parameter of theta, and then we stopped there. And today, let's just continue from here. Good. So when we have the stand fit object. <clears throat> so when we run the model and then we got results. And the, the very first thing, if you have not done that yet, is to um, check the data type of the stand fit object. So recall the idea, anytime we um, construct or we define some data variable, let's say a data frame or a matrix. So if we are unsure about the data type, we could use the function class, right, class in R to find out the data type. And here is the same idea. We got a object, which we have no idea what that type is. And we could try to use this one class fit globe. And then you will see that the, the specific type for this one is actually a stand fit model, stand fit object. And when it is a stand object, there are some properties, properties that you can use. But anyways, uh, we know that now that assume everyone knows it is a stand fit object and what we can do with it. So we, we can print the results of the model. So here what I'm doing is to print the fit object. 
and then the stand function returns to you what we have done, right? To remind us, this is the name of the model and how many chains, MCMC MC chains, remember the idea? How many MCMC MC chains we use and how many samples we use per chain and how many of the samples are for the internal algorithm turning up, uh, tuning up uh, optimi internal optimization, in this case half, okay? And here, this is the uh, critical number. So if we have four chains, and if we have 2,000 in total, and for each of them, half of the 2,000 is for the internal warm-up, how many post-warm-up samples do we have? So this is uh, the calculation. We need to calculate a little bit. So we have 2,000 per chain, and half is not used for the sampling. The other half, the second half, is used for the sampling. So we have four times of this kind of uh, 1,000. So in total, we have 4,000 MCMC samples. So here, all those results are based on the 4,000 valid samples returned from the stand fit object. Good. And then the next step is actually, we want to know the posterior distribution. We want to know the posterior shape of the annual parameter theta, right? So how to, how to get it? As before we know the shape, before we get the plot. So let's see the table first. So the table already give us some useful uh, numbers in terms of the quantile and also the summary statistics. We have here the mean and then the, the, the standard error of the mean, here also standard deviation and the quantile uh, numbers, the cutoffs, right? So here, 2.5% uh, and 25, 50, 75, and 97.5. So here, these two, the last two columns, they are quite important. It is because we would like to know how stable this result is, right? So we have record MCMC MC robots idea, and there is a unknown somehow, there is unknown mountain, and the MCMC MC robots uh, does not have a sensor. Instead, it has an elevation sensor to know uh, the heights above sea level. Maybe if the shape of the mountain is not like this, with one peak, it is. It is. It has an interesting shape. And if the robot is stacking somewhere, so then the results cannot be very reliable. We do have to have some metrics um, to help us evaluate the stableness of the result. How stable that result is. So only when the result is stable, we could go forward. Otherwise, if the result is not trustworthy, how we could do further analysis using that, uh, let's say, wrong uh, fitting object, right? Good. So here, these two last two columns is basically uh, to tell us the metrics of um, evaluating how stable the model result is. So here, the second to the last column is called the number of effective samples. So recall we have here, here, just here, we have 4,000, and out of how many samples it is uh, effective? So, okay, so here, this effective number of samples is 1,200, uh, 1,278. So you might just wonder why those numbers, why there is a term called effective uh, number of samples. How to define this effectiveness? We have 4,000. If in a very ideal case, if every sample is making independent contribution, effectively, we will have 4,000. And because this uh, visiting procedure, this um, MCMC property, so the current step is coming from the previous step. And then the previous step is, was coming from the step even before. So we see here there is a dependency, right? Because there is a visit, this is the MCMC property. This is actually the Markov property. And because the current location is always dependent on the previous one, so there you see this the dependency. <clears throat> so here, because there is the dependency uh, step by step, then some of them, uh, the two samples might be effectively uh, 1.5, for example, or 1.1, .1, or in some other cases, 0. something. So in this case, overall, the effective number of samples is smaller than uh, the 4,000. Okay, good. Um, this column has to be taken together with the very last one because 
there is no golden rule to say how many effective number of samples is good out of 4,000, or the percentage, how much percentage is a, is a good uh, effective number of samples. This is a little bit hard to say, and uh, uh, people don't usually uh, judge the, uh, to, to, people usually do not draw conclusions based only on the effective number of samples. Instead, they look at the very last column. The, R, the last column is called the R hat statistics. So this is a st statistics, somehow like a p-value. So it's, uh, for, it is helpful for us to decide uh, how stable that model is. But in theory, this one, in theory, uh, if the model is very reliable and all those chains are making some efficient contributions to the model, all the samples are making efficient contributions to the sample, the R hat is close to one. So this is a very good situation here. And this is important for you to know. If you don't know here, this N effect doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about that. But here, this one, if you want to use uh, STEM model in your research, if you write paper or, you, or if you read paper, in fact, you will see researchers, they do report the R hat statistics because this is the relevant information for both the reader and also the reviewer. Now you know who, what re reviewer does uh, for reviewer to understand how reliable each model is. Okay, 1.0 is a ideal case. Uh, if it, that is larger than one, that indicates perhaps there is some problem during model estimation. And uh, how large is bad? So th this depends on experience a little bit. So from experience, from experience, or is kind of a heuristic, the one point one is a reasonable uh, cutoff. So any R hat that is higher than one point one, so that doesn't really suggest a stable model estimation. Uh, if we have a model and every parameter, the R hat value, the R hat statistics is lower than one point one, then we could. Uh, reasonably say that the model is stable. Okay, good. I guess you're fine with uh, for now. Just bear with me. Okay, now we go to the next step. The next step is to make the plot, is to see the shape of the posterior distribution because this is what we are interested in. But before that, we could see how the MCMC works. I'll show you a little bit. So just, uh, just one more time, the idea of the, um, the MCMC robots we send the MCMC robot to uh, sample the locations of the mountain. We send the MCMC algorithm to sample, to draw samples from the posterior density. And there are many visits. So you could imagine here, this is the starting point, and the sampler goes here and here and get here and here. So it goes up and down, up and down. And the X axis is the, the number of visits or the number of samples, if you wish. So here it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And um, all those information are the MCMC samples. And here all those samples, all those samples are mixed um, by the chain, the, the chain ID. Here we have four. You see also from the color, so all those MCMC samples or chains, they mix up very well. So this is another indication to say, the model is stable. If the R hat is 1.5, for example, so you might uh, imagine that one chain is, is, is entirely off, is somewhere unrelated to the others. And then this is an indication of bad model estimation. But I will show example later, so don't worry for now. But here, this uh, plot is called the trace plot because it represents the trace of the MCM samples. And uh, the one on the right hand side is including all the samples. So what I'm, what I'm telling you here is that look at the difference of the x-axis between the two plots. So here the x-axis x -axis, x -axis is from 1000 to 2000. And here it is from zero to 2000. So remember we have half of the samples they are used for <clears throat> internal model uh, optimization. This is done here, this part in the shaded area. And here, this part, 
the second half on the second graph is exactly the same as this one. So this is just to show you visually what has been going on when the model was running. Good. And then here, finally, this is the posterior shape of the theta parameter. Good. And you could also plot uh, the posterior density per chain. And then this is mixed by summarizing all the samples from the chains. So the, here the plot is based on 4,000 samples, and here the plot is based on 1,000 samples um, uh, separating by chain. And if you wonder how to get the plot, then, then we could go back to the script. You can see uh, how the ggplot is used to, uh, to produce all those figures. So uh, how to connect, how to draw the connection between this trace plot and the posterior density and how that is related to the grid approximation. We could now make <clears throat> Uh, the comparison to show how actually they are the same that they are the same thing. So here it is the trace plot again. The difference is that now everything is rotated uh, from the original orientation counterclock counterclockwise by 90 degrees. So here this is the trace plot again. And recall here from here this is the first visit and the second and third and then blah blah, blah until 2000. What we could do if you remember what we have done earlier is that we could draw a histogram of all those samples, all those positions. So you could imagine here in the, somehow the middle part, there are a lot of visits. And then this end and this end, they are not so frequent visits from the MC, MC sampler. Now you could already imagine the shape, right? So this shape is unsurprisingly the posterior shape we have seen on the previous slides. And uh, this one is, if you still recall, the grid approximation results of the same binomial model uh, we obtained two or three lectures ago. And these two are essentially the same thing. And now you might just wonder again, because you're smart, so, so why these shapes are not identical? Because we, they, they are the same thing, we want everything. Everything are supposed to be identical, right? Here, it doesn't really look like so as smooth as the, the grid approximation. So here it is because uh, the mc MC algorithm is, is a sampling approach. The sampling is not always as smooth as, as here. But what we can do if we are interested in getting a smooth shape, we could increase the number of samples. We could say, well, instead of 2,000 samples per chain, <clears throat> we could run uh, 10,000 samples per chain and we could run even more chains, we could run eight chains. So in this case, we will have 5,000 multiplied with eight, <coughs> right? <coughs> Sorry, and then in this case, we will have 40,000 <coughs> um, samples. This is 10 times. In that case, we could imagine the shape will be quite smooth. But don't worry about that, so don't have to, uh, we don't have to focus on that. Here we get really um, technically the same results from both the MCMC -MC samples and also from the grid approximation. Good. <clears throat> so to put them all together, here are the result from the grid approximation and the result from the stand the MCMC -MC, um, sampling, we could draw some conclusion. So out of the data, from the data here, six times of water observation out of nine times of experiments, uh, we, instead of getting a point estimation, if we were to use maximum likelihood estimates uh, or frequentist estimates to get the point, uh, point results. So here we get the uncertainty or the relative plausibility of all the theta values. So here, I think I mentioned a few times, but the idea is we know that uh, here two thirds, more or less around two thirds, 0.66, 66 and the relative density is the highest so here it is it means um use uh, it is the it is very it is more it is, it is the most likely uh, parameter results that could have generated data six out of nine 
data points. But we also know that if the true parameter is perhaps 0.5 or 0.75, we could in theory also uh, observe these results. And then the relative plausibility or uncertainty to observe the same data under this parameter or this parameter is lower compared to when the parameter is 0.66. This is, you understand what I'm saying, right? So there is, under, there, there is the uncertainty part. There is an uncertainty around the parameter space. And every parameter here, from zero to one, so everything, it is infinite, right? But let, let's say we have a one thousand, we could say 1,000. We have 1,000 parameters in this zero to one space. And every parameter is possible to generate this data, but the relative possibility is different. So some has a lower relative possibility, some has have a higher relative possibility. So this, this is the idea, the uncertainty part uh, that is described, that is only guaranteed by using a Bayesian approach. <clears throat> Uh, this is what I'm saying already, so I don't have to repeat. Good. Yeah, so when the theta is 0.5, you may still observe the same data. Yeah, so let me finish here. So when we wrote the model, uh, we wrote a version like this. And I actually already showed you that because we are using Bayesian approximation or Bayesian sampling, Bayesian parameter estimation, we have to have prior and to have a prior, we need to write in a model block. So the theta parameter is distributed with a uniform distribution, lower bound zero, upper bound one. And we also mentioned from the last time that this line can be omitted. It is because if we write the parameter in this way, there is a implicit prior distribution of theta that is already a uniform distribution. Okay, so if we write this way, if we do give the lower bound and the upper bound, because we know the uniform dis distribution, it requires a lower and an upper bound. And uh, here, it basically impl in infers there is implicit uniform prior of the parameter. <laughs> Good. Are there any questions? So yeah, I saw the, the question regarding uh, using Mac. Yeah, I told you that I have no clue, but if anybody else is using Mac and could help, so feel free to write to help um, Leo. <clears throat> Any other questions? Everything still makes sense, right? So far, so good. Okay. So before we go forward, um, I can ask you some question. So the question is, what do we talk about when we are talking about the Bayesian model? If let's say you go to a conference, if you whatever, whatever situation, whatever scenario, somebody asks you, what do you do? Or maybe you ask them, what do you do? What, what's, what's your research? And then they say, I work on Bayesian models. Um, wh what do you think? What do they do actually? What do you think? So what kind of Bayesian models do they use? Do they work on? Or is, is, is this a deterministic uh, idea or there are multiple options? So if I tell you I work on Bayesian models, do you really know that what I'm working on? Or it is quite um, um, ambiguous how many possibilities there are?
So now after we have been through seven point half, let's count today half of the lectures. What do you think a Bayesian model is? Maybe let's put the question this way. What is a Bayesian model in your mind? In other words, what justifies a Bayesian model? You can write in the chat or you can just tell me, you can open your mic. Any ideas, volunteer? So the clue is already on the slides. There are at least four different categories. So you're waiting for me. <laughs> um. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, for me, it is uh, also still a bit unclear at some point because we have this fancy theta estimation, and everything. On the same, at the same time, I saw, for example, in Jest that there is something like an Bayesian t test, which just, I don't know, seems as if, if it was a quite normal frequentist method, but with a different output, but. Yeah, like no fancy diagrams and uh, so for me, it's still a bit hard to uh, distinguish uh, what's the benefit where kind of. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Uh, another comment, a model that takes into consideration that we can never be sure about true value of a parameter and we get a parameter estimate distribution instead of single value and a p value. That also makes sense. There's, that is kind of a follow-up comment to uh, what Leo says. Yeah, good. So I can tell you a little bit why I have this question. So why I, add, I, why I included these slides here. It is particularly confusing if you are working with um, like like people like us, like people from the psychology or cognitive neuroscience, cognitive science background. I think for the other fields, if we talk to them uh, and work with beta models, maybe it's not as ambiguous as, as we do. It is because we have another kind of assumption um, to assume that the brain might also work uh, in, a, in a Bayesian fashion. So you, you know, the, the brain, there, some, there is some ongoing theory or debate, which is trying to um, assume that the brain also updates prior to posterior, right? It makes sense. And then there is uh, some ongoing debate. If you're interested, you can, you can watch that, you can read that. But then the idea is there is a class of model that uh, considers is a, is a Bayesian nature inside of the model part. Okay, so this is the y-axis, that's the model class. Is the model a film kind of a Bayesian update or not? Okay, so the binomial function, if you only look at the binomial function, that doesn't really assume too much about the Bayesian thing, right? It is just the counting stuff. It is counting, honestly, the binomial model. And if you, so here in this case, the binomial model is non-Bayesian. But if, if let's say some free energy, if you know what I'm talking about, some predictive coding, and then that class of model, which is focusing on the brain, honestly, they really assume there's the Bayesian thing embedded in the nature, in the future of the model. So here in that case, that is the, uh, the Bayesian part. And uh, the, the comment from, um, who is that? Uh, Jakob and Leo. So both of them, they were talking about here, honestly. So how the parameter is estimated. So we know the frequency analysis. For frequency analysis, the parameters or anything we calculate, point estimation, maximum likelihood, t test, the p value, da, 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 everything. So they, they are the non Bayesian part in terms of the parameter estimate or in terms of the method, how the model is estimated. So this is the question. And we here, from the first one to until uh, one minute ago, one minute ago, 
we are talking about Markov chain Monte Carlo, and that is the model estimation part we use in uh, the Bayesian approach, MCMC or JAX, um, JASP. Also, uh, variational base that also part of kind of the, the Bayesian approach. So, um, this distinction, this difference here, non Bayesian and versus Bayesian, is with, is with respect to the method that is used for model estimation. Okay, so in short, here we have one dimension um, parameter estimation or model estimation, another here category or dimension, that is the model class, whether the Bayesian part is embedded part of the model, the nature of the model or not. Bayesian also versus non-Bayesian. And now you see it's kind of a typical two by two thing, right? We have uh, four total combinations. So we could have, where's my, yeah. So we could have a non-Bayesian model with non-Bayesian parameter estimation. We could have the non-Bayesian model using a Bayesian parameter estimation. And we could have here a Bayesian model. It can be estimated using the non-Bayesian way, very interesting. And also here, here is the full part. We could, we have a Bayesian model, but the parameter is also estimated using a Bayesian approach, okay? Kind of confusing, but I guess if I show you here this two by two graph, and you know what I'm talking about. You know what the difference is. Okay, does that make sense? I guess this really clarifies if you read in the paper, if you go to a conference. And if next time, if you go to a conference or anything, you ask a person, what do you work on? And then they say, I work with Bayesian models. You, you can ask them which part they are, which uh, quarter they, they, they rely themselves on, right? So there, are, it, it is possible that one person, uh, they use maybe half of it, right? Either Bayesian model or non-Bayesian model, they always use frequentist approach. This is really possible. Not only one quarter, it's like one half, but using this one, it is really helpful to help us clarify what, what possibilities there are. Good. Any questions? Yeah, I'm clear, clicking on the Sasaki paper. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that makes sense, yeah, yeah, it's, it is about that, yes. <clears throat> Any questions? All right, so you uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, maybe, I mean, I don't know if we will discuss the, the review paper later anyhow, um, but that was, for example, uh, something which was a bit unclear to me how they uh, combine frequentist and Bayesian methods as I understood it. And what, what, what was your question? Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, how how does it work to sometimes do a frequentist ANOVA and then a Bayesian T-test test, for example, in the same paper? Like, does this make sense to do? Uh, yeah, it's kind of. So we, we know that there is a tradition to use frequentist analysis, right? And uh, now we know that there are people, they are quite promoting the Bayesian approach. They are quite advocated about that. And... Uh, uh, we also know by fact that not too many people are using Bayesian approach. So there is, let, let me put it this way. We know that there is a growing trend to use the Bayesian approach, but the overall people who is using frequentist analysis is way more than this trend. So um, it's like the, the tradition is quite difficult to be turned over, I guess, even though there is increasing trend to use the Bayesian. What I'm trying to say is that we are now in kind of a transition period. So there are people, especially young generation like you, 
So you could you get this uh, uh, um, the the the, uh, the the education or kind of any resources to learn what can be done in the Bayesian approach relative as opposed to the frequencies approach. So in short, it is now in the kind of a transition period. And sometimes people use frequencies analysis and then they also wanted to use the Bayesian approach. Okay, good. And to answer the question, does that make sense to use this, the same, the, both approaches inside the same paper? I think that yes, because it is a reflection of the transition period. We know that during transition and people use, people are using a mixture of different approaches. And then this doesn't really answer the question of why or when, at which time, we use which approach, okay? So um, if you would like to, for example, just simply test the, dif the, dif the difference between two groups, drug and placebo and whatever, and if all those assumptions are met that you learn from the other statistical course, so if the scores are normally distrib distributed and um, so everything is okay, and the variance can also be uh, pulled together or whatnot, doesn't matter. So you can use a t-test. And if there's a difference, you can use the p-value to reject the null hypothesis. This is what we do, right? If the goal is to say, well, I do not want to prove that there is a difference. Instead, I want to prove that there is a no difference between the two groups. So from the frequencies, of frequencies the perspective, and also from your earlier statistical education, you remember that if the p-value is not smaller than 0, uh, 0 0.05, then you can only say you cannot reject the null hypothesis. But you could never say you can accept the null hypothesis. But you see here there is a conflict. At one point, you want to prove there is no difference. And the other, on the other hand, the analysis cannot guarantee you to say, I could accept the null hypothesis. So this, uh, uh, this requirement cannot be met. So what do you do? So in this case, you can use a Bayesian approach. So if you read a paper, you do everything. It's, it is very frequent. Let's maybe not use the word frequent. It is very common to see that people use Bayesian approach to justify or to conclude there is no difference between any group or anything. So this can be accepted. So if you use the Bayesian approach, if you find there is no difference by whatever approach, uh, by, by whatever analysis, Bayesian t-test or Bayesian ANOVA, and that if there is no result, no diff significant Bayesian significant results coming out of there, you could confidently say, accept the null hypothesis. I'm sure that using the word null hypothesis is not even true in the Bayesian framework, but you know what I'm talking about, I guess. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just like, when, when I was reading it, I just felt like uh, you could guess uh, that people maybe tried both and reported the one which worked. It is possible, yes. <laughs> Because it was so uh, frequent dissipation, frequent dissipation, um, which was not really like explained, at least com uh, that I uh, saw it, um, what is why Bayesian? Mm. Yeah. No, but yeah, I, so I, I got your, I got your uh, explanation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, another kind of advantage Besides, if we want to claim, if we want to conclude there is no difference between any group, is here the uncertainty part. This is really unique of Bayesian approach. And if you want to get a uncertainty around any parameter estimation, and then this is the only way to go to. And then there, there are some other advantages I can tell you later. Um, maybe I can tell you now. So the idea is that here we have an extremely simple model. It is the binomial function. There is only one parameter, and we do not have to use the Bayesian approach. We can just use whatever we like. And the result will be stable across all those approaches. It is very good. 
And I showed you earlier when we were trying to justify why we switch from a grid approximation to a MCMC, it is because uh, the grid approximation works fine if we have one parameter. It, it works also fine if we have two parameters or three, maybe up to five or 10, that's also fine. But what if we have 100 parameters? And how you would imagine we could have a nested 100 loops to solve the grid approximation? This is tedious and takes a lot of time. But in theory, if we have a decent computer, this can also be solved. And um, uh, the difficult part is, so the, the likelihood part or the prior multiply with the, um, the likelihood. So the nominator of the Bayesian equation on the right hand side, sometimes or most of the times, if the model is too complex, there is no analytical approach. So the, the solution is not tangible. And what we do, is that we can only use um, a sampling approach to approximate the shape of the post theory. So when we go further during the seminar, we will see quite some complex uh, cognitive models. At the same time, if we want to have uh, the hierarchical structure of the data. So maybe you guys have heard about that multi-level modeling or hierarchical modeling, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, so all that stuff. But most of that cannot be done in the non frequentist framework because uh, there is no solution. You can't, you can't do it. It's not possible. So the only way to do that is um, to do the MCMC Bayesian approach. So I can tell you a little bit more what I, what I learned over, over the years. So when I started the cognitive modeling, I, I started with MATLAB, right, to do maximum likelihood estimation. Um, there is a function called fmin search, if you know what I'm talking about. And uh, when the model was simple, it worked pretty well, and we were quite okay with that. And later, because the task is a little bit complex, and we were trying to, we were interested in some more complex model that could capture all those variants in the, in, inside the task. And then the model is getting, obviously, getting more and more complex, complex. And then the parameter estimation result is getting less and less reliable. Sometimes we cannot really get the answer. We, there's no results returned from mac, maximum likelihood estimation. It runs overnight, doesn't really converge, and uh, it exceeded the maximum, the maximum number of iterations. And then we switched from the, uh, the MLE approximation scheme to the, to the Bayesian one. So first we used something called JAX, and then we switched to STEM, and since then we were really happy because we do, have, we do not have to worry about the complex complexity of the model. We could always get approximation using the MCMC approach. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. Oh, here, there is another question. What is the difference between this one, the Bayesian model, and the, the non-Bayesian model that belongs to this dimension, the model class, right? So here, uh, the, the non-Bayesian model is, for instance, just a uh, binomial model. And here, uh, you could imagine the, uh, especially in the cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience literature. So there is an assumption that um, the brain uses the Bayesian rule, the Bayes rule to update information. So there is a prior in the, in the brain and the brain uses sensory inputs, what the brain sees, what the people see, and uh, what the people hear. It can be just perceptual information, right? Vision and uh, auditory decision-making also possible. And then this sensory information is integrated to the prior knowledge of the brain, and then the belief is updated by considering the sensory input together with their prior. And then this becomes the posterior, obviously. And then this newly formed posterior will be also obviously the next prior and then the person will receive new sensory information, whether again 
some color information, whether the, the weather is good or not. So this kind of sensory information to form new belief. So this is, there is entire uh, class of models that, that, that assumes the brain is working in a Bayesian fashion. And on the contrary, there is another class of model that don't assume the brain works this way. So the brain may be simple or the, whatever. If I do not have to talk about brain here. This is what uh, any other model that does not assume the Bayesian update part. So then that is the, the non-Bayesian uh, model class I'm talking about. For example, later in the seminar, we will see a memory retention model. That one really, there's no Bayesian thing inside of it. But you can estimate that model using a Bayesian approach. For delay discounting model, there's also no Bayesian update. When the, if you see the formula, the, the math. But estimating the parameters can be done using a Bayesian approach. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, good. Other questions, comments? Yeah, so there is a question asking, predictive coding in the brain is really interesting. Are there models that try to model predictive coding in the brain? taking into account the free energy principle. So for me, they are the same thing. The free energy principle and predict coding, they are nearly the same thing. So one is a larger category that contains the other. So this is what I'm, if, I'm, if I got it correctly. But pretty much they are quite similar. And if you know where this idea comes from, the, the person, the professor is called Carl Friston, who is a professor in London from University College London <laughs> and from the UK and uh, anything related to free energy re related to active inference related to predictive coding you can read Carl Friston. It is a little bit difficult to follow it is because as far as I know <laughs> Carl Friston and he has more than 1,000 published articles <laughs> and uh, if you want to follow maybe you can just try to follow the, the, the well the one or two or three the most cited articles from him. And the last year or maybe two years ago, there is an interview from uh, an online journal or whatever magazine is called Weird, I guess, Weird, Weird, I guess you heard about that. And that one you can read, I guess, as a non academic, um, it's not, not really a one academic article. It is written for a non-academic audience, I believe. So that can be the first try. Yes, I need to have to try to find it. Yeah, yeah, that one, yes, great, thanks. And uh, I, I'm not sure how many of you are from this Coxie, my Coxie program, because there and uh, uh, previous education, uh, th th there was a lecture as far as I know about free energy. And I guess if you took it, that's totally fine. You understand what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, I guess there will be future lectures on the same topic. Yeah, it can be too much to talk about here. But I, it, the, the, the link from Verd, the article from Verd can be a very good starting point to read. And also on YouTube, there are quite many short interviews with Carl Friston, six minutes, 10 minutes. And I guess he, he, most of the time, he is also willing to explain uh, the free energy principle in about three minutes. 
And that's also a good starting point to look at. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, so far, so that's pretty much about free energy code, uh, free energy and predictive coding. And any other questions? Okay, if not, we should continue. Good. So we uh, focused on the very first implementation of the STEM model for a binomial function. So now, before we move forward, we have to understand a little bit more about uh, the STEM language itself. And then we could use to take the, the advantage of the STEM language to move forward, to model all of the other models that we are interested in, including regression, including some cognitive models we will be covering from next time, I believe. This time today, we don't have enough time. Okay, so one motivation is, so why do we use STEM? So now, because I, I told you my personal story, we began with maximum likelihood and then we switched to JAX. So here, JAX, and then STEM. So here, the, both JAX and the, and the WinBox, so they are the previous software or, or algorithm that are trying to do uh, MC, MC approximation. So in theory, all of them, they are MC, MC software. So why do we use them instead of the others? It is because the time to converge, so in terms of the performance of the model for effective sample size is a lot faster. Sometimes it can be uh, more, um, 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 taking longer, slower, but most of the time it is extremely faster and quite efficient. I do have models that cannot even be run um, on JAX, but it can be executed instead. So this is from my personal experience. So here, the biggest advantage is the memory usage. So modern computers, laptops, uh, running a JAX, JAX model, is it can be pretty challenging because it will just taking all those resources from, from your RAM and then you cannot do anything. You cannot even watch YouTube. You cannot even write uh, work. Word document, whatever. But if you use them, and uh, if you let your model run, you can still reasonably or comfortably do something else because the memory usage is not much. It's not a big deal if you use them for your model estimation. So here, the last feature or advantage is the language feature. So we know that uh, if we are working in R, Python, whatever we could overwrite variable in the sense that if I say A is four, now we assign four to A. And then later, if we write in the console that A is five, so five will be assigned to A. So in this case, five is overwriting four, right? So you can change the value of the variable, even though the name is A is the same. We, we think this is natural and uh, this is intuitive, but it is not possible in JAX. So here, this overwriting is not possible. It's produced a lot of challenges and troubles for me when I first get started. But this is possible in STAN. So this is very good. And also control flows. The if, if else statement and the for loop is a little bit is a little bit weird in JAX. So then the STAN is quite uh, friendly in terms of that. I'll show you later how this can be, how easy that is to write a flow, a, a control flow, a if else and a for loop. Good. And then if you're interested in there, if you are interested in some advantages, more advantages of using STAN. So here there is, a, um, here I guess, this one, this link, you can click to read more about the stories behind and the advantage of STAN. Good. And here is basically another graph to show you the efficiency of STAN. So here you see uh, the, the three here, this first three, they are the result from different samplers, different algorithm. So here you see it's basically getting stuck there. Here it looks fine, but still uh, not so efficient. This one, relative to the truth, the ground truth, 
they are pretty similar. So you could imagine uh, the efficiency of using Stan relative to the others, okay? So by the way, I'm, I'm trying to say that this maybe 10 to 15 minutes talk is technical. And what you are trying to understand is <clears throat> Stan is good. <laughs> it is the most advanced language to use and you can just use it. What I'm trying to give you is some evidence to prove that it is a, it is a good language but if you don't understand what I'm saying, it's totally fine. You don't have to worry about that, okay? This, this is to convince you, but I guess you're already convinced. <clears throat> Good. <coughs> and uh, from here, so some language feature, every single line should be, must be terminated by a semicolon. So here, if you do not have a semicolon, there will be error. And this is to comment, use a double slash. We talked about it also last time. And then the last one is important. It's important. Variables, they have to be typed and scoped. And this is not really uh, intuitive to understand. I have to give examples. What does it mean um, to be typed and scoped? So here, there is a table. But I, I will go back to this table later. Uh, let's go to detailed examples. So here, the so variables, <coughs> they have to be declared. Okay? They have to be declared. And the idea is that whenever we want to use a variable, we have to declare it. We have to declare the type. If you still remember the exercise we have is that uh, we have to tell us then what the data type is. Is it a integer discrete variable or is it a real number, a continuous variable? If we do not give the type, we cannot go forward. So this, this is the message that you need to remember. Every variable has a type. It is static, you cannot change. If you declare an integer, you cannot later use it as, a, as, a, as if it is a continuum. This is not possible. So you cannot change uh, the type of the variable, okay? And uh, yeah, I'll show you examples. So here is to declare a continuous variable. Right? Simply to use the real here to define a real number. What if it is an integer, a discrete variable, then we use the int, so then that is an integer. So here you, you, you see here from this uh, the box, in the data block we define a variable called n, it is integer. Here in the data block we define a variable called y, uh, the type is continuous. Okay, good. And we could um, superimpose the boundary, the lower boundary and the upper boundary of the data. So this one we have seen also. We use uh, lower and upper in this triangular uh, parenthesis to define the lower and upper bound. And we do not always want to work with scalars. We want to work with vectors and the matrix. So the way to declare a vector or a matrix in Stan is like this. So here we define a variable called A. The type is vector. Here three means there are three elements. So if you know the idea of a vector, um, there are three elements, three empty cells, right? It is a vector called A that has three elements. And then here it is a row vector of B that has four elements, okay? So vector is a column vector. So it's column wise, it's vertical. And row vector is horizontal. So this, this requires you to know a little bit uh, uh, li uh, linear algebra. So uh, here, you know the shape, the orientation is different. And then this one is matrix. I define a matrix called capital A and it has a dimension of three by four, so three rows and four columns, right? Three rows and four columns. And uh, here, the last three lines, they are examples. This one declares a vector called rows with five elements, and all of the five elements, they are between zero and one. So this is the idea. Here, the second example, I declare a row vector called sigmas had, that has four elements. And all of the four elements, they are positive, okay? 
this one, I declare a matrix of sigma with a dimension three by four, three rows, four columns, and all of the 12 elements, three by 12, three by four, all of the 12 elements, they are between minus one and positive one. So here is the, how to declare it, as, I guess as straightforward as we, what we have seen so far. Yeah, so there's a question, we put all those matrices and arrays and stuff in the data list before, yes? It is correct. So we put all of the data variable in the data list, and then we have to decompose the data list in our instance. So we have to get each element in the data list. We do not work directly with the data list. We work uh, with the elements in the data list, and the elements in the data list can be scalar, can be vector, can be matrix. <clears throat> the control flow, as I said, stands suppose a full control flow relative to bin bugs or tracks. So here, this slice is copied from the R introduction. What I'm saying is the control flow of that is exactly the same as R with only one exception which is you have to terminate each line with a semicolon. That is the only difference. Other than that, how you specify the condition, how you specify the statements, and how you write the for loop is the same as in R. So if you know uh, how to use R to write if else, if you know you, how to use R to write a for loop, you, you are safe. You are safe in terms of writing uh, if else and for loop in, stan, in the stand language. Any questions? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, somehow, I mean, maybe that's it's just also confusion. But the uh, the data input looks like way more complex than we would usually have with sigmas and rows and everything. Like when you usually work with it, do you also start off from a data frame usually with like variables per person kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for example, uh, in, the, in, the, in the choice data, if we ask participants to make choices between one and two, between A and B, right? And suppose we have 80 trials and we have 20 participants and we will have a 20 by 80 matrix that contains all the choices. So in this case, we can define a matrix called choice, and here 20, here 80, and the lower is one, upper is two, for instance. So we can do it this way. And we know we have the choices, and if it is a feedback, if, if that is a learning task, we have the choices from the participants, we have also the feedback, the outcome that, that, is, that are received from the participants. Same thing, so we have the wins or losses, and also uh, from 20 participants and 80 trials. So then what we do is to we declare another matrix whose name is outcome, for example, and then the dimension is also 20 by 80. And here, I guess we can use the lower minus one and upper one to indicate uh, punishments and the reward respectively. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. We will see that later. Any other questions, comments? Good. Okay. So this part I will skip. This is the Bonoli model. So I will only give you a one minute introduction. It is Bonoli model is a special case of a binomial model. If we know here, the formula of the binomial model, binomial model, when the capital N is one, it can be reduced in the shape like this, shown below, and then this one is a Bernoulli model. And the exercise here is to, uh, to model the unknown parameter theta, the same idea of using the globe example. But here I frame that as a coin flipping. Uh, basically, what we are trying to do is to fit this 
for learning model as an exercise. I really encourage you to do it at home afterwards. Okay. The folder is this one. So when you have all those folders downloaded, there is a folder that starts with zero three, and then you can fit the model. Okay. So data looks like this. There are twenty times of, of experiments. And the ones and the zeros that indicate uh, the height and the tail of the coin. Okay, this is exercise <clears throat> afterwards. And then this is the results. So if you do the exercise, perhaps you might want to write a loop to loop from one to 20, because we have 20 times. And uh, because instead it is a language that supports vectorizing. So vectorizing is basically trying to take the advantage, take all the advantage of linear algebra, and uh, we could write this way instead. So each, this one here, the flip, even though that is a, is a vector, but every element of this vector is following a Bernoulli function with the unknown parameter theta. So here, this one, and then this one, they are equivalent in terms of how we specify the model instead. And clearly, one with the model, one, one with a for loop, and the other one is without a for loop, you could imagine the time can be saved uh, by running without the for loop. And here, we can see actually we gain some uh, uh, time, not too, ma not too much, only uh, eight seconds. But as you imagine, if the model is getting more and more complex and you could get rid of all those possible for loops and also to optimize the code, you will gain a lot of time benefit. So you, the code will be run faster and more efficiently. Optimization is a, is, is a huge topic of STAN, and uh, let's see if we have time to talk about that later uh, during the seminar. Any questions? All right. So yeah, thinking before looping, that's the message. Good. So now we take a one minute pause and we think about what we have learned so far. It's been a while, right? And we learned the R basics and we learned, learned about R Studio and we worked on some simple commands, how to run the t-test, how to run the linear model, how to run uh, regression, and how to load the data from external disk um, text file, CSV file into R, and then we go forward how to do some simple analysis. This is what we have done. And then we move on to probabilistic theory, prob probability theory. So this is the key of uh, the entire seminar. It is because everything is based on probability theory. And when we talk about probability theory, we have the distinction of the data type. One is discrete variable, the other one is continuous variable. And for discrete variable, we use the term probabilistic um, mass function, so prob probability mass function to describe the probability of a discrete event. And then when the event is continuous, we have two types of probability functions. One is the PDF, the probability uh, density function, and the CDF, the cumulative density function. So recall the, um, the normal distribution, the PDF and normal distribution is like the curve, uh, the, the, the bell shape that we are familiar with, and the CDF of the normal distribution is a, is a sigmoid curve, okay? And then we move down to the Bayesian theory. And before that, we talk about the probability uh, of two events. We have conditional probability, we have the joint probability, we have marginal probability, so all of those ideas. And having, knowing that is really helpful for us to derive the Bayesian formula. And if we know the shape, uh, the, 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 the relationship of marginal probability, conditional probability, and the joint probability is easily, uh, done. it can be easily done to derive the Bayesian formula. And the Bayesian formula is 
the top three area equals to the prior multiplied with the likelihood then divided by something like a normalizing term, right? The P of data. And then we move down to a specific example. So the globe posing example, nine times of experiments, six times of water observation. We've talked we talk about that many times already, three to four lectures. We want to solve the posterior distribution of the unknown parameter theta, the proportion of water covering the entire surface. It follows the binomial uh, process. We uh, tried to solve it by using a grid approximation and uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo using the language called STAN. Okay, good. That's what we have done so far. And now we have to move forward. Um, in this case, I'll be short uh, to extend the STAN model from, it, uh, a, from a one parameter case to a multiple parameter case because we know in the binomial function there is only one unknown parameter, the theta. But in a regression, there are at least two parameters, actually three, you will see what I was talking about later. So um, there, is, there is a real data also from the statistical rethinking book. The data is coming from somewhere in South Africa and the data set contains a height variable and a weight variable, also the age and the gender of that population. And we might be interested in, is there a positive or whatever kind of shape between heights and, and weights, okay? So what we do is that we could run a simple linear model in R to use the weight uh, to predict the height. This is like a really simple linear regression. And we can do that. And then we could observe some kind of shape like this. The X axis, is the weight of the people and then the y-axis is the height of the people and then as a result you could see there is a positive relationship between the two variables and it can be described by this regression line shown in red color okay you know everything about that i guess i'm, I'm sure and uh, how could we do this exercise or to do this analysis using a bayesian approach so Bayesian regression, if you wish, if you want to uh, call that this way. Okay, great. So then we have to do that um, in the Bayesian fashion. Uh, if we would like to run any statistic model in the Bayesian fashion, we have to think about what the likelihood function is. So if you run a regression, you might don't even have to think about what the likelihood function is. You just run it, that's a regression. The regression maybe that there is a likelihood function. That is not true, okay? Regression is not a type of likelihood function or statistical distribution. You have to, cons you kept, you have to come up with the proper uh, statistical distribution that is trying to describe the, what is underlying the regression model. And uh, the previous exercise, we have a binomial function. So here, the likelihood function is in fact a normal distribution. So the distribution we are using is a normal distribution. Why it is a normal distribution, it is, if that is not clear to you. So let me try to illustrate. Here, it is the formula of a simple linear regression. We have two variables. But as independent variable, we can say uh, it's, it is x. There is a um, dependent variable, so y. We are trying to use x to predict y in a linear fashion. And then the linear fashion is declared or described by two parameters. One is the slope, so the slope of the line and the intercepts. Of the line okay for each independent x if we multiply that x with beta and then sum it up with alpha so this one is the predicted data so we can quote mu it is not the actual data and how to make the connection between the unknown uh, here predicted and the known part the data we could say, well, the data is more or less 
like the predicted, but there is also some error term, some some variance, something that cannot be cannot be explained by the model, right? This, this is what we are uh, familiar with. And there is another assumption, which is so how this error term is distributed. So the error term, um, we usually declare that also as a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So the idea is trying to say on average, the error term is somehow zero. So some has larger error, some has lower error, some is positive, some is negative, but on average it's, it's zero. And then there is a standard deviation that describes the error. Okay, good. And now what I'm trying to say is we can actually forget about this kind of form, this kind of uh, way to formulate the regression model. So what we can do instead is, well, we can write this way. So the y, the true data, is normally distributed around here, this predicted mu with a variance of sigma. If that is not clear to you now, uh, I'm trying to show you on a graph, okay? So let's assume this is some kind of regression. So it doesn't matter if that's a straight line or some, some line with curvature, it doesn't matter. On the x-axis, this is the, um, the predictor, the independent variable. And on the y-axis, again, it is the, the dependent variable, what we are trying to predict, okay? And the red curve is the, is the regression line or whatever kind of line. So let's call it regression line. And we know that any dot that is, or that is exactly on the line, so any dot that is exactly on the line here, they are the predicted y given the x. So we know if the x is this one, what is the prediction? The prediction is we go from x to this curve, and we go here. And then this point is the predicted y. It is not the true y. And where is the true y? Very interesting. The true y is here. So this blue dot, is, it is the true y. And uh, so for the normal uh, distribution or for the regression here, we could imagine that this true observation is normally distributed, distributed around this predicted y as a mean and uh, following some standard deviation. Okay? Does that make sense? And for any dots here, we could say, well, if we draw a vertical line here, the predicted y is this one, and then this blue dot is normally distributed around this mean with some variance. And also this line, this blue dot here, we could do the same thing. X is this one, Y is here. And we could imagine this blue dot is normally distributed around this mean here, this mean, and with some variance, okay? So, so every dot here, they are uh, normally distributed around the predicted Y here, on the Y, on the, uh, on the Y axis, the predicted data with a variance. So um, if we know this knowledge, if we have this knowledge clarified, if we have this piece of information clarified, we could then use the normal distribution as a likelihood linking function uh, to model the data between the variables weight and height. Is that clear? So think about, uh, the regression as a normal distribution. Okay, I guess you're okay with that. <clears throat> Good. So now then we can look at uh, the graphical illustration of the normal distribution to, uh, uh, to have a regression. So we have data, weight and height, x and y. So all of these, the data, x and y, they are known 
if that is known, we use the shaded color. So here with the shading and with the shading X and Y, they are the known part. And everything is circle, it is because everything is continuous. So we have the parameter the slope and the intercept. Together with the input independent X, we could calculate the mu, the predicted Y. And the true Y is distributed with a normal distribution using the mean of the predicted Y and the standard deviation of sigma, okay? And then there is a like subject loop. So each I index is representing a person. Weight of one person, height of one person, and weight of the second person, and the height of the second person, for example. And then there's a new terminology of the double circle. What does that mean to be a double circle? So the double circle means it is a dis, uh, deterministic variable. The idea is that if we have a X, if we know the number of beta, if we know the number of alpha, there's, there, there's only one possibility to calculate the mu, right? If we know this is one, this is two, this is one, and we can calculate, then this one has to be three. It has to be three. There is no variance about it. Unlike the other circles. Good. And then to model at instant, so here we are trying to uh, use the normal distribution to represent a regression, okay? We look at here, this line first. So the height of each person or each participant is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a variance standard deviation of sigma. How is this mu calculated? It is calculated above <clears throat> by this line. So the weight is multiplied with the slope and plus the alpha. And these two lines, they happen inside a for loop. Depends on how many people, how many participants we have. <clears throat> so you see there's a loop. There's a potential possibility to reduce the loop by using a vectorization. So here, the second example is to show you how we can get rid of the for loop. Here we can say, well, the same thing, but we get rid of the I index, okay? So here you have to know that the mu is a vector of n elements. So here the mu is a vector. This is scalar. This is also a scalar, but the weight, the weight is a vector. So if you know some uh, linear driver again, um, is if a vector multiplied with a scalar plus another scalar, the result will be a vector. So this dimension, they have to be matched. They have to be matched, right? And then this one, the same. So height is, height is a vector, mu is a vector, the sigma is a scalar. So every height, this element is normally distributed around this mean accordingly. And then we go to the second person. We go from the top to the bottom. So there's another way to rewrite everything. So we can write everything in one single line. So we can get rid of this uh, mu calculation. We can write that inside, directly inside the normal distribution, the normal function. So the normal here, the mean is this calculation. Okay? So here, this line. The final example is to show you how to do a simple linear regression instead of two variables. Here is the independent variable, and here is the dependent variable. And a little bit different from what we have known already, that there are two parameters in linear regression, the slope and the, the, uh, the intercept, the alpha and the beta. There is actually a third parameter the sigma. That is most of the cases, in most of the cases, implicit, but you have to have it there. You do have to have it there. Otherwise, there is always a single line. There is no variance that can be considered by the model. Okay, questions. 
So do we basically do a regression for every person? No, you cannot do a regression for every person. Eugene, sorry. <laughs> you cannot do a regression for every person because for every person you only have one a pair of data, one x and one y. You cannot do a regression from two data points. So you, ha you have to consider uh, all those data points. But you do this distribution thing per person. That is possible. That is possible. And another question is what happened to the for loop in the third model? The th here, this one, the third. Uh, the, the for loop is, is not there. It's, uh, you, don't, you, don't have, you do not have to have the for loop. The second and the third they are the same. And here, because this one is a vector, this is also a vector, and you do not have to write the for loop. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the implementation, I think I will never write the first one because there is a for loop. I will either write the second or the third, depends on how comf comfortable you are with writing in this way. Because sometimes if you're a beginner, so writing in this way, the second way, it is in, in fact much clearer because you know there is a mu calculation, which is the predicted here, the predicted. And then there is the likelihood linking part. And if you are familiar with this already, and if you're comfortable uh, getting rid of this entire thing, feel free to write the third line. That is fine, that is totally fine, okay? Good. Any questions? So the next, next question is, well, it is a Bayesian formula. It is a Bayesian parameter estimation. We have to have priors, okay, two minutes, and then we are done today. So we have the prior for uh, the intercept and the prior for the slope. But we could use some kind of knowledge to have uh, the to construct the prior. So this one is height, and uh, we can say well the mean for the intercept is, is one seventy um, meters with a one meter standard deviation. So this is a very wide intercept. This is possible. It's okay, right? And then this one uh, for the slope, we write a normal distribution mean is zero and the standard deviation is 20. So that means uh, a priori, we assume there is no slope. The slope is a flat line. There is no relationship between weight and height. But it can be uh, by one unit standard deviation 20, positive 20, so a positive correlation or positive uh, uh, relationship between weight and height, or it can also be negative 20 by one unit standard deviation. So negative uh, association between weight and height. So the idea is to make it wide. So you have some kind of knowledge, but to make it wide enough. So this is called uninformative, no, weakly informative prior. It is informative, there is some knowledge, but it's weak. So there is not too much um, uh, constraints about that. So it is wide enough that it can uh, have, it can um, cope with different possibilities. So what is different is this one. So here for the sigma, the standard deviation parameter of the normal distribution, we have to use a half Cauchy distribution. So half means we only take the positive half. It is because uh, as a standard deviation, it cannot be negative by definition. It has to be positive. So we take the half, the positive half of uh, the Cauchy distribution. So the mean is zero, not mean, so this is actually the median of uh, the Cauchy and with some scale parameter 20. So here I tell you why to use a Cauchy distribution instead of something else, maybe let's say a normal distribution. So it is because um, Cauchy in the first place, if you have no idea, Cauchy has similar shape relative to a normal distribution. It is, it is also symmetrical, kind of a bell shape with two parameters, one is the location parameter, the other one is the scale parameter. The difference between the normal and the Cauchy is that the Cauchy at the center part, it is lower relative to the normal, 
and then the tail is, is taller relative to the normal distribution. So what you could imagine is the area under the curve before five of a normal distribution is larger than the area of the curve uh, than the Cauchy. Conversely, because uh, the sum under the entire curve is 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 is, is one by uh, by half divided by half 0. 0.5. So here the area under the curve is 0. 0.5. The other one, the area under the curve is also 0. 0.5. If the sum is constant 0. 0.5, if here is smaller, then the other part has to be larger, right? This is obvious. So we know that the area under the curve of a Cauchy above this scale parameter is larger than the area under the curve of a normal distribution. Okay, this is the technical part. How is the interesting? Why we use that? It is because if we declare this one as a prior, we grant the majority of the density in between zero and five, but there is also a possibility that the parameter could go beyond five, and the possibility is reasonably large. And if we use a normal distribution as a prior, then the possibility for this parameter to go beyond the five is just smaller, which means we have a stronger prior, but we do not want to have a stronger prior. We want to have a weak but useful information. So that's why it, that's why it is called weakly informative. So you see what I'm trying to say? So the reason is that we want to have some information, but we do not want to have a strong information. We want to have a weak information. And the half Cauchy is a very good weakly informative prior for the variance variable. So if you see from the, the Andrew Gelman's book, and he really recommends to use the half Cauchy um, prior as the standard deviation of the normal distribution. And if you, you know the package BRMS, and they also use a Cauchy prior for standard deviation, and also somebody you mentioned this JASP for doing the Bayesian t-test, Bayesian something, they also use the Cauchy prior. So here this is how or where the base that the Cauchy prior comes from. Okay, good. And uh, the last one is how to implement it. How to implement it. I encourage you to do that at home. And from the next time, um, we will focus on cognitive models. Yeah, and then the slides I will send to you. Good. And then this one I'll tell you, uh, this is also important. So when we fit the model, we also have to check uh, how the posterior predictions could capture the shape of the data. So this is called posterior predictive check. And then here, the area, the shaded area, it is the 95 highest the density interval, similar to the, um, the, the confidence interval. So we see if we define a 95% highest density interval, so it's basically would cover 95 of the data points. So here it says uh, the posterior prediction could capture the shape of the data. And if I'm showing you a, a polynomial second order uh, regression, the data is curved. There is a curvature in the data. We could fit the model both using a first order polynomial and a second order polynomial. The fitting can be done easily. So we, we can fit whatever model to the data, even though uh, the shape cannot reflect the shape. The, the shape of the model cannot reflect the shape of the data. Uh, what we do is we have to consider the posterior prediction. In this case, the posterior prediction is not good because the prediction is a linear line, but the data is a curvature line. Here, if we use a second order polynomial, both the model and uh, the data, it is, a, it is a curve. So that means the posterior prediction could capture the pattern of the data.